the biggest brand in business and business news in the country is back. Welcome to the business news that matters coming up on the program tonight. They are calling it the second wave. A surge in COVID-19 cases is on the rise around the world and here at home. We knew this would happen because they told us so. At some point during the pandemic, we accepted this as the new normal and calls to open up the economy were made and adopted. Some sectors were opened and others are yet to open, but they may not, as seen from the rising cases. The first wave of COVID cases decimated the global economy. What does the second wave mean when you see it from an economic point of view? That is our conversation on Business Review for tonight, so stay with us as we get that conversation going. And still coming up later on tonight's edition of Business Review, you and I know that the Victoria Falls is one of the seven wonders of the world. This right here. However, it's not just a seventh wonder. It's another cash cow for the country, a source of foreign exchange. Now, here's a question. Do you think that foreign tourists should pay more than they do to see the Victoria Falls? Someone thinks so. We have more details after this message. The Victoria Falls, as you can see in my picture that's coming, this, like I did say, is the seventh wonder, among the seven wonders of the world. Not the seventh, but among the seven. Now, a Livingstone-based tour operator has called on the Ministry of Tourism and Arts to consider adjusting entry fees for foreign nationals at the Victoria Falls. Abseil Zambia and Smiles Tours and Safaris Operations Manager Mulele Sikaneta said the current rate of 20 US dollars for foreign nationals is not benefiting the National Heritage Conservation Commission. Mr. Sikaneta said the Victoria Falls is the only tourism attraction that entices foreign nationals to Livingstone and that NHCC would benefit more if the entry fee is increased. He wondered what $20 is to someone who's paying $4,000 for a return ticket to come into the country. He says this is the only gold mine we have in Livingston, but are not getting much from it. Mr. Sikaneta said that the entry fee should be hiked to wait for it, $100. United States dollars. Let's move on to our next story. Zambia's trade surplus has increased to over 96.8 billion kwacha in the first six months of this year compared to about 91.8 billion kwacha the same period last year as the national inflation dropped to 15.8% for July. Total trade comprises imports and exports of the country. However, Trade in June decreased by 0.8 percentage points to about 17.07 billion kwacha from over 17.2 billion kwacha in May. Zambia Statistics Agency Statistician General Mulenga Musepa said the country recorded a trade surplus value at 1.56 billion kwacha in June from about 3.84 billion kwacha recorded in May, indicating a 59.4% increase. Let's move on to our feature story on Business Review for tonight. Like we did say, our conversation is hovering around COVID-19. This, like we did say, is being called the second wave of the virus. The first wave came with damaging impacts on the global economy. My guest tonight is Mr. Chivamba Kanyama, the Chief Executive Officer for Bridges Limited. Welcome to Business Review. Thank you. Wonderful. Congratulations for your presentation style for Business Review. It's a first class. Thank you. Really first class. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah. Thank you. Good. It's good to have you in the program. Thank you. Thank let's you. let's let's begin by looking at first of all before we focus on the on the on, on the second wave of COVID. Could you try to describe for us the damage that the first wave of COVID has had on the economy from the time that Zambia recorded its first case? Well, we have had loss of businesses. Uh, some have collapsed. Others have lost uh, revenues by as much as 30 percent. We have had massive retrenchments quietly done by some companies and we know the reality is that uh, we will not end the year the way we had anticipated it in terms of the uh, phys physical position of, of the Ministry of Finance. So everything has kind of nose dived and uh, the impact uh, uh, is uh, now getting worse with the new wave of COVID. Thank you. What do you make of government's response to try to fight this economic damage? I think the first uh, action by government, the first three months, was excellent. All the ministries were very active. The Minister of Finance was giving us updates, and the response was significant by everybody. Uh, it, it appears now it's, it's like the new normal is really becoming the new normal. People are just accepting it, and government seems to see 
that uh, we just have to continue with the business as we have done before. Uh, we know that it has uh, issued a bond with 7.8 billion kwacha and much of it taken is at now. So there's kind of some liquidity in the market now. And we, th this is the best uh, uh, time now to think that we may not end the year as we had anticipated. Especially when you look at the half year performance by the budget. And I, I thought it would be the worse off than what we have seen. That's 5% drop in revenue is not as bad as we had anticipated. So uh, depending on how government responds again, we may not be as worse off as we thought. Though the growth prospects are about uh, uh, four or five percent uh, in a decline as we end 2020. What about the, the, the corporate response to government measures? For example, the 10 billion stimulus that government put in place. How have the corporate you know, uh, entities responded to it? It has been a very, very slow start. Uh, very, very few banks initially applied. Um, for, to benefit from that fund, mainly because they were looking at the margin between the monetary policy, policy rate at the time and uh, the, the, the ceiling on the interest rate of 17.5%. The margin was very, very narrow. Now, uh, after government reduced monetary policy rate to about 9 to 5%, uh, most uh, banks now see so the margin as widening. It was it motivating them to come forward. So we we know about four or five billion has now been taken up by by banks and a few microfinancial institutions. So now they are beginning to see some benefit out of it. The, the, there's also been a lot of conversation around you know the IMF deal and whatnot, and that's something that's still ongoing. How do you think this this whole thing has been handled? Um, I, I think uh, if things stand now, we are yet to hear from the IMF. Uh, it's a pity we cannot li lay our hands on the back-to-office report. That gives the actual detail on what's transpiring. Uh, many Zambians have already written off the negotiations and said, look, it has failed, and Zambia can't get anything from the IMF. I am of the view that there are some internal negotiations taking place. Because for, for, for a, a decision to be made, it's beyond the negotiating team. The team that was discussing with the Minister of Finance is not the deciding, deciding, fact, the, uh, deciding factor, unless it's a no. A no, they will quickly put it across. That's an automatic no. The mission chief can put that across. But if there is some kind of uh, vague response, it means that, uh, that the individuals have to go to the head of the Africa Department to give a report, and then Physical Affairs Department, then, then uh, the, uh, the policy and the strategy uh, department has to come in. So the, 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 the decision, including leg, legal department has to come in to the whole management of IMF and the board. So the process is longer than what people think. So I personally do not think it's completely written off. So, uh, like you said, the process is long. Sh should yeah. the country just sit on its hands and wait? What other options are available as we wait for that IMF decision? Well, government hasn't sat on its rails and say, uh, said, look, let's wait for the IMF. They have gone on plan B, which is raising domestic revenues. They have issued bonds. There's another new bond now. Um, which they are issuing. So uh, to me, it's government trying to mop up liquidity. As you know, when things are down, it's not that everybody is down. Pension funds still have got some money. And, uh, you, you know, government can issue treasury bills to institutions uh, to participate, like institutional investors, like NAPSAs and other pension funds, the mutual funds. And But they have got some ceilings as well. They cannot expose a portfolio to one asset, which is uh, government, corporate, government bonds or treasury bills. Most of them have a ceiling of about 30% of total exposure. So if government has uh, issued treasury bills, uh, they cannot issue anymore. So they have to come up with another product. And government has been quite innovative coming up with new products to, to enable these, um, these entities that have got ceilings to participate again. So they are trying to move liquidity from banking system back into the system and pumping, pumping it into the market so that the suppliers and other people have got money. So this is unlocking uh, some Supply, you know, because when, once they have high demand, then manufacturers are able to supply into the market, and that is keeping the economy to run. So government hasn't really sat. They've been quite innovative, and I congratulate them for that. Thank you. What about business productivity? Uh, yes, government is putting in place these measures, but what can businesses do to meet government halfway? Uh, businesses have had some, in, uh, I, I would call it some voluntary lockdown. Even if the government has uh, allowed them to participate locally, many of them have instituted voluntary lockdowns. Uh, people working from home and cutting down production. This is a little bit negative to the economy right now because we are not able to fulfill the level of demand, especially given that the borders are on kind of some lockdown now. We cannot get as much imported products as we did before. Um, so I, I feel that most businesses are treating this with a lot of caution, 
But because of the KPIs that they have to meet before the end of the year to their shareholders, a number of these businesses are beginning to participate. And what I know is that they are pushing their banks to apply for those funds, the $10 billion by the Bank of Zambia. I know many of these entities that are now pushing their commercial banks, please, we want to access that money. Go and access it on our behalf and we want to borrow it. So this is beginning to reactivate the economy once again. So you may see by October there will be such a high level of economic activity. And, and one indicator to that is that inflation is kind of stalling right now. It's, uh, it's, it's stalling. It's actually reducing marginally. It's an indication that there's some level of supply coming into the market and the system. Thank you. Th there are some uh, comments that the World Bank did make in a statement. I'll, I'll, I'll read the first one and, and then I'll, 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 I'll get your comment on it. So the World Bank says, and I quote, should COVID-19 outbreaks persist? Should restrictions or on movement be extended or reintroduced? Should disruptions to economic activity be prolonged? The recession could be deeper. And that's the economic recession, end of quote. We, we see that this may come. With these you know, cases on the rise, some restrictions may come back. Maybe airports may be closed. How does government strike a balance between avoiding cases going on the rise and still maintaining the economy to perform? Yeah, first of all, we should admit that we're in a recession. And there is documentation to that effect that we're in a recession right now in that most companies are under 50% uh, capacity in terms of production, except for the copper uh, industry that you just highlighted now, which is doing well. And I think the copper industry is supporting this, supporting some level of growth that there have been some increase in supply irrespective of COVID. And to me, that is one indication of some softening somehow, that even if there is some total recession, which is indicated, there are some lines which can still survive the COVID. And copper production is one of them. And we looked at energy sector as well. That is where we should um, get much more investment because it, it's very possible to increase our production in the energy sector despite the lockdown. Let us isolate companies that are mostly hit and prone to COVID uh, impacts and those that can still survive and sustain production even if there's COVID. Agriculture definitely will be affected, but because it's outfield largely, we don't see much impact. And one way government has responded now to, to potential impact uh, of recession on the agricultural sector is by getting fertilizer and input early into the system. That, to me, is one way of responding adequately to a potential damage that low, out, low, low output can cause the economy. So somehow, there's been some kind of response to this. And we need to get to the smart Zambia effect. You know? Let us use much more of the smart Zambia enabling technology to enable the processes to continue to pump out, to, 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 to be active in the market, to pump out supplies without people feeling the impact of the lockdown. So there's a, a, a window for us to still survive. There's a window for us to beat recession. If we can sub, uh, sub, substantially isolate sectors that are prone to the COVID, especially the hospitality industry that, I mean, as you mentioned just now, there's very little we can do about hotels and lodges and tourism, but there are other areas of the economy that can still survive in the heat of COVID. In, in September, the, the budget will be presented to Parliament. Uh, what, 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 what message do you expect to come out of there for government to communicate that, look, we are responding to COVID? Because I know that the, the budget for 2021 will reflect more COVID than the previous one because we didn't of know course, then. Of course. What do you expect as a result of COVID? How do you expect COVID to influence the next budget? The first thing is that government sources of income are reduced right now. And government has to signal to the market that, look, we only rely on you. IMF is not coming on board just as we thought they would come on. So the only source of sustainability for this economy lies in expanding the tax base. And we have got no choice but to induce everybody who is in production to be taxable. And we have to ensure everybody is compliant to tax payments. Not only very, very few, those who are compliant, there are many people who are non-compliant. We have seen a huge trucks, a lot of trucks being impounded by the, the DRA. That is just uh, an, a tip on the iceberg of what is really happening about people evading paying tax. Suppose every Zambian was compliant. I'm very, very sure that the current revenues of the Zambia Revenue Authority, which is about 60, 60 billion kwacha, can actually treble. 
we have got capacity locally to increase our revenues. And government doesn't even have to look far outside Zambia to supplement its budget. Just about compliance and compliance and compliance. And for me, it's a two-edged sword. On one hand, reduce unnecessary expenditure, prioritize spending on one hand, and also ensure there is, there is compliance and compliance on tax payments. And that can actually help us through into the 2021 budget. For me, I do not foresee a, cha a challenge. When I saw the report by the Minister of Finance about the half-year performance, I said to myself, actually, we are not as bad as we thought we would be. In other words, there's potential, even in next year, 2021, when the real impact of COVID is now seen and, 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 and felt by almost everybody in the economy. Zambia can still survive through compliance. The, the taxes you mentioned, some people may disagree because they feel that the citizens are already overburdened with taxes. Government hasn't increased taxation past I don't know how many years now. Pay as UN has remained the same for as long as I can remember. There hasn't been any increase in that. I do not think that there have been any adjustments. Most of the tax, tax uh, measures government has undertaken, I would call them housekeeping measures, kind of to rebalance certain things, really announcement of this and that, just to rebalance. And government comes up with those policy measures just to ensure that the economy is active and there's compliance. Otherwise, we have not really had any serious tax adjustments. But whenever you are facing a crisis like this, and the sources of income, especially the, the likely candidate, the IMF is not coming on board on time, the time we think they can come on. There is no other choice because we cannot increase on debt now. We cannot go out to borrow from the commercial lenders, the non-concessional loans. We are already rooftop up there. The ceiling, the headroom is no longer, no longer there. Debt sustainability tells us that we are about 104% because of the devaluation of the question, 104%, which is the debt to, uh, debt to GDP ratios. We are above 100%. Now, the only source of it is local. We have to look at the domestic market. And I, I personally feel, I, I know it's not a very good message, uh, it's not about increasing taxation. It's ensuring that everybody pays tax. And that is the suggestion I'm giving. It's not about increasing the tax levels, no. You can actually reduce tax levels if everybody can be compliant. All we want is that everybody must pay tax. If my company is as small as bridges are compliant on tax, what about those people who are filling in goods and, and lying and cheating, saying this is uh, something else when it is something else? And there are so many of them who are not telling the truth. That revenue loss is so huge that we don't, we don't even need to be in a deficit position as a country. We shouldn't be. It's about compliance and compliance and compliance. Now, everybody must be compliant without increasing taxation. Actually, we can actually reduce on the taxes. Thank you. As we come to an end, looking at all these responses government has put in place to COVID, if you were in a position to make a change, what would you have done differently? Um, the first thing, like I mentioned earlier, is leverage the Smart Zambia platform and ensure it is not only accessed by the public sector, it should be accessed by the private sector as well. Number two, which is very critical for me, which is very, very critical, I would undertake labor law reforms. Now, this is a message that the unions will not like. Unions won't like it. But to me, you have asked me what would you do differently. I would flex labor laws to allow companies to hire and fire without penalizing them on the huge redundancy packages. Now, this is a discussion that can take us for a long time, but I've got reason for that. The current labor laws in Zambia protect people who are in employment, but they stop people who are not in employment to join employment. I don't know whether I get my point here. Yeah. The labor laws protect people who are in jobs, but they don't allow companies to hire more. If you look at developed economies, they go through cycles and the government allowed for the safety valve that when things are going down, you can easily declare redundancies. When the economy picks up, because we shall pick up, companies should freely bring on board new people. But companies in Zambia are very scared to employ new graduates to, to, to tap into the labor market for those unemployed young men and women. Because once you join, you are locked up. The penalties are very high if you relapse on pay as UN, for, uh, on pay as UN you relapse on NAPSA, 
penalties at 20% per month. What happens now? Companies don't talk. The companies will never go on the street to demonstrate. They just act. What do they do? They don't employ. And I can, personal, I can change that dynamic overnight. Getting companies to get as many graduates as possible so that we don't only protect those that are in jobs, we bring on board many more into the employment stream. And especially during the time of COVID, when companies are really stressed, I can relax labor laws to accommodate for retrenchment and re-employment after COVID. Thank you. You're most welcome. That's our conversation on COVID with Mr. Chibamba Kanyama, Chief Executive Officer for Bridges Limited. Business Review will be back after this. Let's move on to our final story on business review for tonight, Texas to Nigeria. Now, this is what's happening in Nigeria. Our focus is on Africa's biggest retail outlet, ShopRite. Familiar brand here in Zambia doesn't need much introduction. However, ShopRite, Africa's largest retail chain, announced on Monday that it is considering divesting from its Nigerian retail entity. ShopRite Nigeria operates about 26 outlets across the country and employs about 2,000 employees who are 99% Nigerians. A divestment actually means that it will sell its holdings to another investor who will continue to run the business. According to the company, it has taken a decision to leave following approaches from various potential investors looking to invest in the Nigerian entity. The group also says the decision is in line with its re-evaluation of the group's operating model in Nigeria, one of the 15 countries where it currently operates. ShopRite also confirmed it has initiated a formal process to sell its entire stake in the Nigerian entity or a majority stake. Now, why is ShopRite leaving Nigeria? Here's why. ShopRite's explanation of its intention to divest from Nigeria appears to be anchored on its investment expectation and operating environment. However, there could be more to it. Firstly, Nigeria is a highly competitive space where retail is the survival of the fittest. Following ShopRite's foray into Nigeria in the year 2002, the retail chain disrupted Nigeria's retail space, giving ordinary Nigerians a test of what it feels to shop with family and friends. But the fairy tale was not going to last forever. Previous retail outlets like Park and Shop rebranded and injected significant funds in the operations and business expansion. Park and Shop rebranded to Spa and has 14 outlets across Nigeria. It only makes sense for them to divest having held onto the Nigerian operations for almost two decades. ShopRite also competes with homegrown retail outlets, especially in Nigeria's commercial city, Lagos. Retail outlets like Ebiano, Citidia, and Adiba are now household names that are expanding rapidly across Across the state. There are also several neighborhood supermarkets in the nooks and cranny of Nigeria's commercial capital piling pressure on ShopRite's market share. ShopRite does not disclose revenues from its Nigerian operations. Here's another reason. ShopRite is also going online. Shopping actually is going online as evidenced by the growth in online shopping since COVID-19 hit Nigeria. Local competitors like Spa and the Biano already offer online shopping experiences and deliver goods to customers' doorsteps. ShopRite doesn't do that. ShopRite's business model relies heavily on physical store visits. As internet services become faster and cheaper, more Nigerians will rely on e-commerce to meet their shopping needs. Here is the final nail in the coffin for ShopRite. Nigeria's harsh operating environment is also another major challenge ShopRite faces. The Mohadu Buhari-led administration through the CBN has focused on supporting locally made goods by banning forex availability for the importation of local substitutes. This has negatively impacted the number of products ShopRite can sell and how many new shelves it can create per floor space. It also creates supply chain challenges, especially with locally produced goods. So that 
in a nutshell, is a story that explains why ShopRite is leaving Nigeria, Africa's leading retail outlet, leaving Africa's most populous nation. And that story brings an end to tonight's edition of Business Review, but we have more business stories on the business news that matters coming to you next week at the same time. Good night.